everybody, I am Jeff Straw from Pure Mind, uh, Director of Marketing here at this lovely establishment. I'm joined today by my good friend and, and, and musical visionary, I might say, <laughs> Simon Shackleton. It's lovely to be here, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. We've been trying to get this to happen for a while now, so yeah. it's um, yeah, it's a real pleasure. Since before I even worked here, I was trying yeah, to Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Here, I mean, I can see why. It's very, very, very impressive, so yeah. He just got the tour yeah. uh, of the whole training facility. And let's talk, I mean, while we're, while we're here at the school, talk about that. You had a very different formal music education than what we do here. Yeah, it's so interesting for me. I mean, I, I kind of, um, I, I almost stumbled into electronic music in, right at the beginning of the 90s. Um, and and at the time, I mean, I, I, I remember my dad buying me um, a synthesizer for my 16th birthday, bought me a SH-101. And... Um, and over the course of two years, I think I spent pretty... I, I, I knew that machine inside out, every conceivable sound. I remember those charts on the back of the, um, the, the manual that showed you how to get the sound of a clarinet or a flute or something, which is just such a funny kind of link back to those, those days where you take this machine that actually does what it does you know, analog synthesis brilliantly and comes up with these amazing futuristic sounds and the people that made the manual wanted you to make it sound like a clarinet. <laughs> Fantastic. But I was kind of, you know, my parents are very much from the sort of classical music background and um, and the opportunities to go to music college to do this kind of thing simply didn't exist at all. So, um, so I went and did... Uh, a degree in classical music and I um, I majored in original composition so I used to do a lot of um, uh, manuscripted work all kinds of stuff and some quite experimental bits and pieces but you know some more sort of traditional ensemble stuff as well. Did you like writing for small or large scale of course sort of like quartets well, and yeah I mean for or, my or my, uh, my um, for my finals um, I had to write a twenty-minute piece, a manuscripted piece, and I, I set this uh, this piece of poetry by an American poet called Galway Kinnell, uh, who wrote this uh, amazing book of poetry called the Book of Nightmares. And I kind of sat that I set this. It ended up being a kind of you know in seven different acts, um, but I had a string quartet, I had a choir, I had a narrator. I had a bunch of people playing synthesizers, I had some car parts, and I had some actors who were out front, you know, car parts were, were used as musical instruments. And all this stuff was notated on this massive score, and and I was there kind of conducting it and bringing it all together. So it was a real, it was a really interesting project, and it was almost, the, you know, the beginnings of tying those two worlds together. Um, but I was also, at, at the time, I was, I'd begun to DJ, and it was really Acid House that, that that kind of flicked the switch into proper electronic music, and then from from then on, I I kind of went on a mission with, you know, really early Ataris. I mean, my you know, I had a I worked off an Atari for three or four years. Nice. Um, with one megabyte, that was that was that was what came as standard. It was a one one meg, and you you booted it up off a five and a quarter inch floppy. Mm-hmm. So and you had the yeah, the Atari eight hundred, right? Basically, yeah. yeah. So all, all you could do is you could uh, you could send out tiny little pulses, MIDI triggers, and that was it. Um, just, so just exactly like today. Yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> when did it get so easy? Seriously. I mean, I can carry my whole studio on a laptop now. And it's, well, um, and, you know, to fast forward to kind of today, and you're, yeah. you're, we were talking earlier about, you know, your DJ sets now. You don't even, obviously, we both come from the vinyl era. I used to buy your records all the time. And then we moved to CDs, which were certainly more friendly on the back. And yeah. now it's thumb drives. Well, they, they, you know, they've been, they've been a, an amazing transformation. I mean, the CD thing was, um, at the time, it felt like, a, you know, an incredible progress from vinyl, just in terms of what you could take with you. But at the same time, my, my working week used to finish at usually Thursday morning. It was Thursday, I'd start burning CDs for the weekend and I'd get all my music together and I'd do edits of stuff. And um, So every week I was throwing stuff out of the CD wallet and uh, just a huge thing. Right. And it, was, it all became actually very unwieldy. And you know the CDs, the optical drives are, were quite prone to getting dust and dirt and they jam up and you know dust in places like like the desert you know that that's <laughs> <laughs> burning man is a, a great example i mean i've had i've done sets there where i've been playing in the middle of a dust storm with cds and i've had the sound camp i was playing at had um four different cdjs and what they'd be they'd have 
they'd have each one in bits whilst I was playing on one that they just fixed and there was this kind of rotation <laughs> of it, you might get two tunes out of it and then it would just break down and someone would come out with the air dusters and try to put it back together again and it's just ridiculous whereas the thumb drives no moving parts so it's um they've been really rock solid so yeah and talk about Burning Man a little. I mean, it's been, you're hugely identified with the scene. Obviously, San, San Francisco and Bay Area loves you. A big, I would think, part of that was kind of the Burning Man culture. So, yeah. Talk about what it means to you. And it's been, it's, it's been an insanely inspiring few years, actually, because I think, you know, around 2009, when I first went to Burning Man, I, you know, I was, I wouldn't say I was running out of energy, but I was definitely, um, I felt like I was looking for something else. In, in my DJ sets and mm -hmm. the first year I went there I did what I've always done and I bought my bag of tricks and played my music and um, and it was just it, it was just an incredibly humbling experience just to get there and um, have so much love for what I did and I was kind of saying it's my <laughs> first year and, and people would say things like it's without doubt not your first year. You've been here for ten years because we've been hearing you wherever we go <laughs> on the fire. Like, oh. That's yeah, same. That's really it's cool. really awesome. Um, and so you know, and, the, and one of the reasons I went that first year is because Opulent Temple asked me to play on Burn Night. Mm -hmm. So I did a back to a two and a half hour back to back set with Meet Katie, and we we actually spent five days in the studio just working on that set <laughs> and editing everything and just tightening it even rehearsing the set which i would never normally do you right. know um and uh and it was you know there's five thousand people there and it was burn night and it was just absolutely life-changing mm -hmm. you know um and so so then going back you know with each year that i go back i've kind of refined the experience a bit and, and realized that um you know what i want to get out of it has changed over the years and i'm not i, I don't particularly you know, I don't particularly go there now for those big fire and brimstone, big spectacular EDM style moments. You mm -hmm. know, and I'm not saying Opulent Temple was never really like that. It felt like a, a kind of, a nighttime version of, of District, which is the you know the big day camp that I camp with. Um, but they, you know, they have kind of evolved musically over the years, and you know, District's very much kind of techno and tech house, and very kind of in tune with the. the daytime hours so that f for me those kind of like sunrise sets particularly have been an amazing experience to me and it's really why I've evolved this one series um, uh, of parties that I, that I do. It's I don't even need to ask questions you're just going right <laughs> into the next thing see how you do that for me you're so good to me. Yeah checks in the post. So, <laughs> so you were just here for one series that's why you're yeah. in San Francisco yet again uh, yeah. you're here a decent amount yeah, Not I mean, a ton, but I mean, for a yeah, guy that's in the UK, you, San Francisco is a good scene for you. Right? It's been an amazing scene for me. It really feels genuinely like family, and it, yeah. it, I, you know, I, I have probably ten times more friends in San Francisco than I have back in the UK. Well, you live on a farm. I do. I, I have isolated myself. <laughs> splendid isolation, but um, you know, um, it, it, yeah, it's, it's it was magical though. Like the, the vibe that night uh, at, at, at yeah. Public Works, it was how many people you say went to? Uh, we the had door? nearly nine hundred, around about nine hundred. Uh, and so. it's and it, so for those that may not know, the one series is so seventeen opening DJs. You play for twenty <laughs> minutes, yeah. and then then there's a closing DJ that juggles. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So um, <laughs> it's it's you know it's it's, it's um, Simon all night long. We'll show yeah. the picture. I took a picture of the set list. The, <laughs> the, funny, the, yeah. the right, which is which it shows the DJ order. Normally, everybody wants to know like who's this guy yeah. playing when they show up to the club, and so it's him listed like on eight different time <laughs> slots. It's but fantastic. We did, we did have we had um, we had a couple of people actually on the event page saying set times question mark right you know and so it was just a sort of you know I loved it that's a ridiculous response to that but um, but yeah I mean they 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 they've really evolved over the years. The first one I did was in San Francisco mm -hmm. four years ago now. And um, the idea really was to bring a piece of the plier out into the default world. Now, I, you know, I kind of grew up on long DJ sets when I s started out. I'd play for six hours. Those were, that was what was expected of you. And you were expected to be very eclectic. And I always have had a massive broad range of musical tastes. But the one series, um, you know, I really wanted to do something that was a story. There's a proper... It's like writing a novel as opposed to a short story. So you really do, you contain that storyline from beginning to end. And you can, I think when you start looking at 
looking at a night like that, I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? If you, you know, you go out and you go into a club for four or five hours, you want, a, regardless of who's DJing, you want an, an arc that mm -hmm. makes some kind of sense. What, what you probably don't want is you don't want to be standing there for 95, 100 minutes while someone's playing a trap set and, you know, you're by the bar kind of, you know, trying to fix an extra set of earplugs and waiting for the whoever the deep house DJ is to come on next or whatever it might be. But, right. you know, you, the, the, there have been so many occasions where... Or the this ride that so many guys that, give you, which that, is just the, the drop of the track and well, then down yeah, and then it. the next one and then it goes a little higher. Well, yeah, exactly. It's kind of manic. Well, the, the, a lot the, of yeah, guys... The, the point is like brick wall limiting to take <laughs> it back to a production <laughs> right. thing, right. isn't it? But, you you know, if you, if you just slam everything into a brick wall and all the dynamic range is lost, then all of the subtlety and the energy ends up being lost. So what, what, do you, what, what can you then throw at the wall? Well, you can try and find a bigger sound. And that's what's happened. I mean, you look at things like dubstep, for example, that's exactly what's happened with that. It happened with house music, where house music ended up becoming Gabba, mm -hmm. you know, going way, way back, because it had to, people had to experiment with the extremes, and they have to find like where that brick wall literally where you hit it and sure. it, and it's really once you I think once you've hit that point and you kind of look back and say well actually you know at the end of the day this is about music and it's about grooves and it's and 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 then maybe people start looking at how they can bring a bit more soul into things because it really at the end of the day it's like you slamming something into a brick wall is a, it's a one trick pony and it's right. and it gets old very quickly and it's the same it's the same with DJ and it's the same with long sets you know you have a you have an opportunity to really experiment you know and really take it out there so so you talked about mark or me yeah Katie, right? yeah and who's i also dearly love and you've probably collaborated with him more than any one yeah person is that fair to say yeah right. you guys have done tracks together for a long 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 yeah. time yeah not as much lately no funnily enough i mean i spoke to him um I was speaking to him just last week, just before I came out here, um, and we, we haven't really spoken much in a, in a year and a half. We've both been very much just doing our own thing, and um, and you know we were just talking about uh, looking to the future next year and possibly uh, doing doing something that comes back to to that kind of ethos of of, of sh you know sharing things a bit and having a bit of a partnership and doing a few collaborations and I, um, <laughs> I know i'm no i'm not alone yeah right so, so talk about how that's different than you sitting down to write a simon shackleton track um like the just collaboration in general like even genres aside like you be you being the sole driver versus like you and mark yeah how, what's your how's your approach different um the Collaborations are always really interesting with Mark because we both come at things from quite a different point of view. I've always been very, I've, I've been quite technical in my production. I'm quite geeky about it. I've always, mm. um, I've always liked to get into the zeros and ones on the production side, you know. And and actually, um, Mark's always been more of a vibe creator, you cool. know. <laughs> so he's 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 a you know I, I'm kind of I'm getting into the to the. Um, to the sonic properties of a hi hat sound, and he's thinking more about well, are people going to dance to it? You know, right. so his, you know, we we we're actually able to, he, you know, he he's able to kind of stop me getting too geeky with the sound, and I'm able to bring him more into the production nice. process. So, you know, and we, we've done tracks in six hours from start to finish, pretty much, and then I've kind of gone away and had a secret tinker for a day just to get the hi hat sounds <laughs> right. But, you know, don't tell anyone. It's not. But you, you, know, know, you hear that, me, Katie? <laughs> You're not your hi hat anymore. Yeah, longer. but it's you know that's that, and that that actually works really well. Well, and certain guys don't have the patience to, yeah. to be that guy. No, that's right. And that's why so I mean, so many duos and trios yeah. generally generally have the sort of more super uber production focused guy. So let's, yeah. let we talked a lot about music. Yeah. Want to play us some stuff? Yeah, sure. I'm I curious mean, to to hear. It's a bunch of things, right? You've got a new record coming up that's yeah. going to be a full length. You think? Uh, it is a full length. I mean, I've, I've, it, it's, it's a weird one for me because I've, um, you know, I've had some of this music has been around for a while, and, um, and I really, really just got sick and tired of going down the label route mm. of, um, you know, doing a two tracker for Beatport and literally throwing a big bag of shit at this massive wall and waiting to see what sticks you know because it, it just there's no soul in that at all and, right. and, and even even for me you know it's kind of comes down to my attitude to the 
to a lot of club music these days and I love it and I consume a lot of it but you know with this album I just didn't want to make any you know and I really did want to take I wanted obviously that's always within the music or it's it's kind of embedded in what I do but I also wanted to take my foot off the gas with that yeah. a bit and and just focus on on the music because ultimately you know it doesn't matter you can have all of the tools in the world and all of the high tech in the world or you can have you know a, a pencil and a rubber and a microphone but ultimately what it comes down to is a, you know a good idea is a good idea and and I think people forget that a lot when they they're getting you know very wrapped up in what's the newest plug-in what's the newest technique and style and whatever I mean you ultimately people have never once listened to one of my tracks on the dance floor and come up to me and said you know what I really love that track but that clap sound really what what were you thinking so you know i just prefer to focus on the on the music the music side of the piece so yeah